Hi everybody and welcome to today's event. Uh, thank you for joining. My name is Juliet Tunstall. I'm the External Events Officer here at the International Institute for Environment Develop and Development. Really delighted to be here with you all today and really looking forward to today's discussion on COVID-19, debt relief and the climate and biodiversity crisis, which will start in a few moments. I can see uh, a few of you are joining us now, the numbers going up. So today's event is part of the IID debates, IID debates webinar series, which aims to create a space for conversation and debate um, on key and current sustainable development issues. If you're interested in signing up for regular um, updates on the events, we have a newsletter and I will share the link towards the end of the session. Uh, I think that's it from me now. With that, I'll hand over to Andrew Norton, IID Director, who is going to be moderating our panel today, um, introducing the, the topic and the speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Juliet. Many thanks for all your work setting this up. So today's event will explore how we can tackle the triple crises of debt, climate change and biodiversity loss using debt for climate and nature swaps. Um, we're introducing a recently released IAED report tackling the triple crisis using debt swaps to address debt, climate and nature loss post COVID-19. Um, Paul Steele, one of the authors of that, of that report will present the work. Um, and I should also acknowledge Sijar Patel from IIED, who's the co-author. So even before the pandemic hit, fears were growing over developing country debt, which had surpassed 8 trillion US dollars by the end of 2019. And the pandemic has made the situation worse in many ways, the economic impacts of the crisis are pushing millions more women, children and men in lower and middle income countries into poverty. Um, there are also, of course, the health impacts are extremely difficult, challenging for those countries to deal with. Um, and the countries are also facing macro problems, hits to exports and tax revenues. Um, all in all, we can expect to see debt in low income countries rise pretty rapidly, and it's doing so from a basis that was already highly problematic and unsustainable and indeed impinging on the capacity of lower and middle income countries uh, to deliver basic services to their populations. So as part of pandemic economic rescue packages, um, we're exploring the proposition that governments have an opportunity to address simultaneously the, the crises of debt, climate and biodiversity loss. Um, through the new, use of a new system of debt for climate and nature program swaps for the benefit of lender and debtor governments, as well as private creditors. Um, so the basic idea is that we can use these to support a recovery that builds forward to a um, more sustainable future with better outcomes in terms of both um, the climate crisis and the global crisis of biodiversity loss. So to discuss this today, I'm delighted to welcome our excellent panel of speakers. Uh, Paul Steele will present this work um, first, and then we have two um, excellent discussants, Sonia Gibbs and Dr. Shamshad Akhtar. So Paul, I'll introduce the speakers now. Uh, Paul Steele is Chief Economist in IIED's Shaping Sustainable Markets Research Group and an author of the report, Tackling the Triple Crisis. He specializes on the linkages between environment, climate and poverty reduction. And Paul has more than 20 years experience with international organizations, including UNDP, the European Union, the World Bank um, and IUCN, as well as UK and Sri Lankan governments. Um, Sonia Gibbs is the Managing Director and Head of Sustainable Finance at the Institute of International Finance. Her work covers global debt and sovereign debt policy issues, financial stability risks, sustainable finance and capital markets, development in emerging and frontier markets. Sonia leads IIF's policy work on sustainable finance and infrastructure investment, including liaison efforts vis-a-vis -vis the G20, the multilaterals and the international regulatory community. And last but not least, Dr. Shamshad Akhtar served as governor of the State Bank of Pakistan and finance minister in the last caretaker government. 
She has worked for several multilateral institutions, including the United Nations, where she served as the Under Secretary General of the Economic and Social Commission of the Asia and Pacific UNSCAP and Senior Special Advisor on Economics and Finance of the UN Secretary General and can currently serve for five years as UN G20 Sherpa for Development and Finance Tracks. So it's an excellent panel, really looking forward to the discussion. And I will start now by handing over to Paul for a short presentation on using debt swaps to address debt, climate and nature loss post COVID-19. Great, well, thanks very much, Andy. So I'm gonna, as Andy indicated, present the report that I um, authored, co-authored with my colleague, Sergio Patel from IID. So this is the title of the report, which I think you've all received already, the link from Juliet um, in the Eventbrite um, instructions. Um, but this will be a short presentation to uh, illustrate the report for those of you who've not had time to go through it. So it's, as Andy indicated, tackling the triple crisis and you, of using debt swaps to address debt, climate and nature in a post COVID-19 world. So the three crises, first of all, there's a debt crisis. As you see from the graph, there's both rising public and private debt uh, for the last few decades. The blue uh, coloring indicates that private debt has been going up slightly more than the orange public debt, but both have been rising uh, quite rapidly. Uh, the second and third crisis are the climate crisis. You see here a picture of a flooded house from my thinking Kenya. And then in terms of the nature or biodiversity crisis, there's an example of deforestation with a photo taken of uh, logs being cut down in Mozambique. So that's the triple crisis. So what are these debt for climate and nature program swaps, which we're proposing in this paper? Debt for climate and nature program swaps where a creditor allows the debt to be reduced in one of three possible forms. First of all, conversion to a local currency. Secondly, uh, possibly uh, paid back at a lower interest rate. Or thirdly, some form of debt write-off. So all of these approaches would in some way reduce the debt. And then the answer is, how can this money be used? The money can be saved uh, in terms of poverty reducing and growth enhancing climate resilience, for example, uh, planting climate resilient crops, climate emissions mitigation, for example, investing in renewable energy, or biodiversity protection, such as investing in reducing human wildlife conflict, which plagues many protected areas. So these are the three ways that the debt reduction could be used in terms of the swap. So how do we get these debts large scale? And this is what we set out is necessary in terms of the post COVID challenge when the debt has, was already significant but has now really become uh, very large. So far, nature or climate swaps have been focused on smaller projects where the, managed is man, where the money is managed in trust funds by international non-governmental organizations. We propose instead that these swaps should shift from smaller projects to larger programs through the use of what we call budget support. And this is where funds are paid into a debtor government's own budget. This has three main advantages. First of all, budget support allows for larger amount of funds to be swapped. And as I indicated, that's vital given the uh, circumstances of the post COVID debt crisis. Secondly, budget support increases debt to government ownership. So that instead of the uh, links of the swap being to an international NGO, it's through a government's own budget. And thirdly, budge, a budget support approach allows accountability to national citizens through the budget. So instead of, again, being accountable to an international NGO, the budget process allows the normal budgetary system to be linked to national citizens. 
This approach has already been used by small island developing states or SIDS and least developed countries. Uh, to give two examples, in the Caribbean, the small island development states have a climate and nature swap proposal, which they tabled at the recent uh, UN Secretary General's climate summit. And secondly, the least developed country initiative for effective adaptation and resilience or life AR has a similar approach where uh, local government systems are used. In the paper, we set out what are the priority countries for climate and nature program swaps. These we identify by ranking countries according to four criteria, as indicated in the slide. First of all, according to debt distress, how much debt are they facing? Secondly, according to climate vulnerability. Thirdly, according to biodiversity richness, how much uh, valuable biodiversity do they have and how, to what extent it's being lost and threatened? And fourthly, how credit worthy are they? So how well will the money be used if they were given debt relief? And you see from the table, the different priority of countries. So the highest priority for this kind of approach is Cape Verde and Vietnam. Second priority are the countries of Honduras, Kenya, Nicaragua and Papua New Guinea. And the third priority are Cambodia, Kyrgyz Republic, Madagascar, Mozambique, Senegal, Sri Lanka, Uganda and Vanuatu. So all of these countries are high priority. Uh, they all have debt distress. They all have, they're all climate vulnerable. They all are rich in biodiversity and they all have strike quite strong credit worthiness. What are the benefits of climate and nature program debt swaps? And I've identified the benefits against various different stakeholders. So first of all, for ministries of finance and central banks and debtor governments, and hopefully we'll hear more about this from Shamshad when she talks about the example of her country, Pakistan, there are hopefully these uh, debt swaps will lead to increased growth uh, by reinvesting in uh, climate resilience, which is needed to increase growth in, in many of these vulnerable countries. There's also increased ownership of debt swaps, as I've already indicated. In terms of climate negotiators who uh, attend the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, this approach will uh, identify new sources of climate finance that will dwarf the Green Climate Fund. So while there's a lot of attention on the Green Climate Fund, the potential of a climate for nature global swap initiative would dwarf the money in the Green Climate Fund. Thirdly, in terms of China, which is the largest holder of bilateral debt, they are hosting next year the UN Biodiversity Convention. And one of the aims of that convention is to finance biodiversity. So by initiating or being involved in initiating such a, a debt for nature and climate scheme, they could uh, contribute to the aims of the Biodiversity Convention. Fourthly, in terms of private creditors, and here we'll hopefully be hearing more from Sonia, from her organization with rep which represents many private creditors, there are a number of advantages. First of all, increased debt sustainability, so they won't have to hopefully provide more debt to countries in the future. Many of these large global asset managers have themselves cl climate commitments, such as commitments to reduce emissions of, uh, of uh, greenhouse gases. And also there's a possible scheme we propose in the paper that if the EU was involved in such an approach, they could use existing emission credits from the EU uh, credit scheme uh, to, to pay off creditors. In terms of the, uh, the next stakeholder, the Paris Club, that's the OECD countries who, who are creditors, they could have a new source of finance for climate, uh, which many of them have already committed to, but is being challenged in the, uh, in the austerity that will be faced post COVID. And finally, I just wanted to identify the UK which is host of next year's UN Climate Change Convention, COP, will also have a new source of climate finance, which they could champion 
in terms of this approach. So here we come to the final slide with a forward look. We propose in the paper and a number of other groups are working alongside us uh, to call for similar things for an international initiative on climate and debt program swaps. So we call on the international community to work with debtor governments to establish a technical working group under the guidance of an international body such as the World Bank to develop a comprehensive and coordinated climate and nature program swap initiative over the next three years to address the triple crisis of debt, climate and biodiversity loss. And it's hopefully an opportune, it's an opportune time for this kind of uh, process to take off with the World Bank and IMF annual meetings coming up next month. So this kind of technical working group could get going there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, Paul. Can I just ask you quickly before moving to the online poll, the, the next element, you indicate that the majority of experience in terms of debt for nature and climate swaps has been project based rather than program based. Would that be true? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just quickly, what are the key advantages of the program approach? Well, as I set out in the presentation, uh, it can uh, allow the swaps to be larger scale. It can be allowed them to have greater government ownership and greater accountability to national citizens. Great. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, OK, we've now got um, a quick online poll, um, which uh, the question in it, Juliet will be putting this up, is do you think debt for climate and nature program swaps are a useful approach? And yes, no, possibly are the options for response. Right, so yeah, mixed responses, very, very few no's though. So that's generally a very positive response. 58% uh, yes and 39% possibly. So it's great to see that there's basically an appetite for exploring this approach among today's participants. And now we're going to dig a little more into some of the opportunities um, that this approach that for climate and nature swaps presents as well as explore some of the challenges. So now um, if I could go to our first discussant, uh, Shamshad Akhtar. Um, Shamshad, general responses, please, to the concepts that uh, Paul has outlined and the approach that he's outlined. But it would also be great to hear from you how, what you think the government perspective on this in terms of the opportunities and challenges um, in um, indebted developing countries is likely to be. Shamshad, please go ahead. Uh, thanks for presenting uh, the findings of the, of the report. Uh, the beauty is in the simplicity that has been offered. Um, I think we have to recognize that we are in a heterogeneous world. So no one solution will fit all uh, is something that I, I do feel. Country ownership has to be a fundamental element, but for uh, debt swaps to work, we have to go with a big bang. We need a global deal. We need common understanding of its objectives and we need a proper architecture for it. We have to respect sovereignty of the debtors and value of creditors' obligations. We have to recognize that uh, key priorities that countries face may be different from the, other, the others that are being floated. Lastly, uh, let me mention that right now, since we haven't gotten out of COVID, it's still unfolding. And there is a huge degree of uncertainty as to where we'll end up. Um, countries are still in a rescue mode. Uh, and I can tell you from my country standpoint that the highest degree of attention is being paid to still fire fight uh, to uh, ensure that the businesses uh, are restarting effectively, people are getting relief. So any funding that is coming forward, be it through the IMF, the World Bank, uh, quick dispersing operations, uh, it is all being devoted essentially uh, for the uh, by and large 
non-development expenditure with social safety nets, revival of businesses. So as yet, there hasn't been much thinking on the debt, on the debt swap, but I do think this, are, this is a very um, good instrument and it is very much wanted uh, given that we have to go to the next stage of building back better and it has a potential to do so. Thank you very much indeed. That was, as for anyone who missed the introduction, that was Dr. Shamshad Akhtar, um, formerly Minister of Finance and Governor of the Central Bank in Pakistan and many other things as well. Many thanks for those uh, perspectives and particularly for reminding us that this remains a crisis situation that we're not in any sense coming out of the other end of this. So this sense of what's the segue between um, when countries essentially need relief assistance and when that moves to a build, building forward to a better reality, if you like, and the green recovery questions is a, a really key element. So thank you very much indeed, Chanchad. Um, I'd now like to move to our next discussant, um, Sonia Gibb from the IIF. Sonia, it would be great to hear a bit from you about the opportunities of this approach from a private sector perspective um, and perhaps reflection on the challenges, but also any just broad observations on the material that we're discussing today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and our thanks to the IIED for including us in this very timely event. Um, just to, to say a note about the Institute of International Finance, we represent a, a wide variety of creditors in international debt markets. And that's something that Paul highlighted that I think is very important. The creditor base for these countries is so different now. So not just uh, on the commercial side, not just banks, but also institutional investors, bondholders, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds. So you have three distinct buckets of creditors, commercial, multilaterals and official bilateral. And that's important to remember when you're thinking about the design of solutions like debt for nature swaps. I, I wanted to uh, add a little perspective here on uh, our work in channeling private sector support for the G20 debt service suspension initiative. And I suspect uh, most listeners will be familiar with this, but it calls for a short term suspension of, of debt payments for the world's poorest and most vulnerable countries. Uh, and both official and uh, private creditors asked to participate on, on comparable terms. So the latest data from the G20 shows that 42 countries have applied for debt service relief, allowing them to delay a total of uh, about 5.3 billion in repayments due this year, and that's about half of the total that's owed to official bilateral creditors. Uh, countries have by and large not asked private creditors for relief, uh, and this is largely due to concerns about market access. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, many would argue, many have, that this is, is by no means enough. So World Bank President David Malpass has noted that the risk of relapse to debt distress is, is very high and that a more systemic approach to debt relief could include reduction in the stock of debt. And I think we're going to be hearing quite a lot about considerations like this, reducing the actual stock of debt that's been built up, which is where solutions like debt for, for nature swaps can play an important role. But the bottom line and something I wanna emphasize is that the debt problems we're facing can't be dealt with by public or private sector alone. So debt for nature swaps are a great example of the kind of collaboration on the toolkit for addressing these urgent problems. Uh, just returning to this market access question and also to the kind of borrower perspectives that I think are often lost in some of these discussions, unless we're taking the view that low income and developing countries should only have access to concessional finance, private finance is absolutely needed to maintain liquidity and avoid future solvency problems. So our discussions with borrowing countries suggest that many concur with this view, believing that development finance can't be met fully just by official creditors and donors. So whatever solutions we look toward, they need to preserve countries' ability to access market finance. You know, we have a, a lot of discussions. We have a, an investor group representing over 100 of the largest global investors, something like 45 trillion in assets under management. And so our goal has been trying to build consensus around ways the private sector can help. And I just wanted to share some of the, the things we've been thinking about in our, in our discussions. And 
First of all, the, the, this COVID crisis is probably the first where sustainable finance and responsible investment tools and mechanisms can make a real difference. And this is particularly true against the backdrop of rapidly growing investor demand for ESG assets, and that's very well documented. So it's kind of bringing these two things together in an interesting nexus, debt and sustainability. So we've been thinking about the use of innovative sustainable finance instruments to help in, in a specific context of emerging market sovereign debt crises. So to, to, to sum up, I'll just share a few ideas from these discussions, and these have included SDG bond funds, guarantees, and swaps. So, for example, SDG-aligned bond funds, as Paul had mentioned earlier, can be significantly scaled up, building on the experience of the uh, um, Planet Emerging Green One bond fund developed with the IFC. So another example of where you have multilateral and private sector collaboration. This could really be expanded to uh, funds investing in emerging market SDG-linked debt. So that's a, a, an area, a niche of the asset class that has potential for tremendous expansion. So as this is structured, you could have, for example, a, a first loss absorbing junior tranche, tranche of equity leveraging an IFI balance sheet, giving credit uplift, and that would in, attract not only existing investors in, in this type of debt, but new investors, so tapping into to a, a new part of the creditor base. And you know, this, this, this first loss equity tranche could be substantially leveraged as much as sort of five to one on, on some estimates. Another example is uh, partially guaranteed SDG bonds. You could have new issuance that replaced existing emerging market sovereign issuance designed to avoid economic loss for investors holding the debt. And they could have a strong SDG component. So that could enable a partial G20 or official guarantee without principal or interest free payments for the first year. And importantly, you know, and, and getting back to the question of, of liquidity, right? I mean, when you have a relatively small market, we, we calculate that the universe of SDG linked debt, so that's green bonds, green loans, SDG linked bonds, and so on, is only about one and a half trillion in total, which is a tiny fraction of the total global bond universe, which is over 110 trillion. So SDG part with bonds with partial guarantees could be eligible for, for index inclusion. And that's really important in, in attracting more investor demand. And finally, another thing that we've discussed in our investor groups is a debt for sustainability swaps. And that's a kind of a, you know, debt for nature swaps are a, a subset of these clearly. And these can help connect sovereign restructuring or even sort of debt suspension to commitments to invest in environmental goals. And so the idea here is to, to scale up and broaden to, to service the whole SDG range. So when you enter a debt restructuring, when a country goes into debt restructuring, they can engage directly with their private creditors that want to support this transition. And an increasing number of investors do see this as within their mandate. So not just a question of sort of immediate quarterly short-term returns, but having more of a mandate to focus on longer-term uh, sustainability goals. So just linking it to the G20 debt service suspension initiative, this temporary moratorium in debt service payments could free up fiscal space, which could then be committed to invest in a country's sustainable development goals. So and I think there's, we, there, were, there was a, an interesting paper out from the LSE that did some calculations in the case of, of Argentina if you took 200 billion in bonds with a seven and a half percent coupon and swap that out for 6%, you could free up, you know, an additional 3 billion a year in additional cash flow, and that could be kind of set aside for SDG investments. So just to, 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 to finish up here, there are a few considerations when we think about these instruments. To, to, to make this concept work and scale it up across emerging and, and developing economies, you need, you've got to have good, um, disclosure and reporting and accountability. Uh, ownership and accountability, as was just mentioned, is, is critical from the emerging and developing economies themselves, leadership from the IFIs, and, and above all, you need to generate that demand from, from private investors. And commitments are, are growing by the day, so these debt for nature swaps have tremendous potential. I'll stop there, thanks. <laughs>
It's really, really helpful, Sonia. Thanks. On this question of market access, is this predominantly around the ratings agencies, Moody's and so on? Is that what drives that concern that uh, if, debt's a, if debt is written off, that it might somehow affect a country's rating and therefore their access to capital? I think that's an important part of it because it's how private markets work. In order to, to scale, you need standardization. To have standardization, you need consistent ratings. Ratings have a process. Ratings see, and particularly in the case of Moody's, they've, they've ascertained that debt service suspension is a potential economic loss and therefore it affects the, the rating. It's, it's not an easy thing to get around because it's part and parcel of the functioning of markets. Yeah. Thanks very much. Paul, do you have any, anything, um, any quick reactions to Sonia or um, Shakhtar's uh, comments? Um, anything that you want to pick up quickly before we go out to the, the audience for Q&A? Um, well, just from Shamshad, I would agree with her that uh, the focus now is on the immediate recovery. So um, these things need to follow up on that. Well, obviously, uh, countries are focusing on the short term now, but, but hopefully they're moving to the medium term at the same time. Um, and then on, from what Sonia was saying, she was talking very much about SDG approaches. So SDGs obviously are, are broad and sustainability are a broad uh, term. I mean, we were zeroing in on the nature and climate dimension of that. So, uh, but I think much of what she says is relevant to the, uh, the specific uh, focus on nature and climate. Okay, that was great. I mean, many thanks to all three of you. Those were really, really excellent contributions. Um, so I'm now going to uh, move to the Q&A. Um, and we've got a rating system for our questions. So I'm going to use that um, initially to prioritize. Um, so the first question is from Mark Burnett. What is your sense of the appetite from countries that hold debt for the program swap concept. Um, I'd like to go to all three of you on that, but Paul, do you want to start? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's obviously a key question. I mean, you need to look at both the creditors and the debtors, but, uh, but you don't want this to be a top-down thing pushed by the creditors. We need demand from the, from the debtor governments as well. And as Shamshad said, there are issues of sovereignty uh, at stake. Uh, I mean, I think there are countries who, who would be keen on this approach. Uh, we've, we've had some interesting discussions with the UNDP who were going out to their uh, member countries to see who, who, in, who in the membership is interested in taking up such an approach. Uh, as I mentioned, I think some of the small island developments, developing states have already uh, had a proposal uh, which was presented at the UN Secretary General Summit uh, at the end of last year to do such an, uh, uh, climate swaps. So I think the appetite is there, particularly, as I say, amongst the small island development states, which have a lot of debt and are particularly climate vulnerable. But uh, as we've also identified in our priority list, there are some countries which may not be immediately obvious, such as Vietnam, which, uh, which has quite a lot of debt, particularly to China, which may, or Sri Lanka for that matter, which also is quite indebted to China, which might also want to experiment with such an approach. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, Shamshad, uh, what would be your sense of the appetite um, from countries holding debt for the program swap um, concept? I think the appetite will be first a function, right. The appetite will be first a function of how the debt stock relief evolves. Of course, we have G20's first uh, reaction to it, the debt stands, uh, service uh, standstill. Uh, that, as we know, is only until December. It is uh, the repayments after a few years, uh, and there is a grace period. But that doesn't take care, it doesn't create the needed fiscal space as yet uh, to venture out to uh, experimenting with different. So that's one element of the appetite. But also, as was pointed out, there is a private and a public sector mix. And with the private sector position being that we'd like to be in a voluntary mode, uh, I'm not sure countries are going to be 
having that great an appetite because they are looking for more uh, certain solutions to the to the debt problem and the debt surge um, is at different level depending on uh, small island economies yes but uh, the low income countries and middle income countries that have huge uh, outstandings and unsustainable debt uh, in different and are facing very difficult so that environment and complexity has to be kept in mind. Uh, it remains uh, to be established what balance between debt relief and debt for climate swap will be appropriate in different uh, heterogeneous situations. Uh, obviously, what would be helpful, and there has been a lot of discussion and the UN uh, Financing for Development platform, uh, is uh, how do you really um, plan out uh, an adequate debt relief for these different countries given the magnitude. I personally think an outright cancellation uh, combined with, of course, an IMF World Bank framework, which has a policy component as well as a management component with very much defined uh, elements for it, would be very helpful. Now, it is important to recognize um, that we really, what we really need um, is uh, sustainable emphasis on sustainable recovery and green recovery. So as we design uh, the swaps, we have to recognize that we would have to put in elements. I mean, of course, uh, it's it's great to have biodiversity and different elements of, of climate, but of immediate need is sustainable development, sustain compliance with sustainable development goals, uh, building back better. Um, so it's these elements which need to be packaged with a debt swap, not just you know. And of course, it will vary. Some countries will go for debt for nature swap. Others would go uh, for more focused uh, recovery and green recovery and sustainable recovery basis, which is rich in job generation, because that's what matters today is job generation, so that the um, debt sustainability is also assured. If you have assured sustainable growth, you have um, jobs there. Then, So my own um, feeling is that uh, countries will stumble. They will do uh, specific uh, preferred choice uh, debt swaps. But what would be preferable is if we came out with a proper framework which has a policy elements, IMF conditionalities, if one uses that word, although I would hate to use that word because nobody wants to listen to a conditionality in such a crisis mode. But what I really meant is that if you direct the countries in a right to the right direction for promoting for rejuvenating growth which will help bring down uh, the debt gdp ratios thank you very much uh, shamshad um sonia i think you spoke to that um quite a bit in your comments in fact to that area so i'm going to move to another question for you um do you think that giving ownership in national budgets for the swaps may put off creditors, including obviously private sector creditors that you've spoken about a fair bit, who may fear, whether justifiably or not, possible defaults or financial difficulties in the future for such governments. Um, so hang on a minute, I've just lost that as it moved. This is one of the hazards of using this thing is that the questions move up and down. But anyway, I think you got the basic point there, Sonia. <laughs> So it, it, it's a difficult question. I, I think, you know, the, the phrase accountability and, and conditionality are, are very important. And Shamshad mentioned the IMF um, framework in this context and, and IMF conditionality. And this is clearly very important when considering particularly longer term arrangements of the type that we're talking about with, with debt for, for, for nature swaps. So I think there, there, there is certainly going to be an element of in any, any time you get something that's relatively novel or that hasn't been done at scale, you're going to get concerns around the, the terms and conditions on which it's executed. That being said, 
I mean, one thing that this DSSI experience has, has clearly demonstrated is that private creditors believe that borrowers need to be engaged, involved, and you know, accountable themselves, right? Because we all know of the debt problems, we all know of the ways in which they can be resolved and the need for resolution, but how it's done is important and borrower voices shouldn't be lost in this, in this equation. Thank you very much. That question was from Matt Collis. Um, Shamshad, do you have anything that, um, any thoughts on that, whether difficulties could arise because um, creditors may fear that money may be repurposed in later budgets away from the original purpose of the debt swap? Yeah, well, it's uh, highly likely that it would be, particularly in a program budgeting um, context, uh, having worked on these budgets in different countries. I would much rather um, choose between uh, project program approach versus um, what I would uh, call a more um, defined framework, however we tailor it. And in that context, I would much rather prefer that when we are talking about uh, an institutional framework to coordinate, uh, given that it takes so long to do these things, and given that you want to give the countries the choice to pick and choose, that it would be better if the international community agreed on a climate or whatever uh, preference we have uh, of the objective or the focus of this. I mean, uh, we could have an a climate investment uh, trust fund placed at the World Bank, uh, and it has predefined um, conditions, uses, um, and then any country that wishes to tap goes with this debt settlement and draws on, on that. The other is to actually look at a recovery fund where you could have a resilience uh, and recovery fund. Again, you define it and you give option to the country to come and tap because you won't know. Uh, time is too short, uh, limited and you can't have, you know, it takes a long time. It takes two, three years to prepare a climate debt swap or a debt nature swap. You look at the past historical experience that to prepare the projects, it takes time to coordinate countries, it takes time. So give it to the countries. You just set up the institute, the funding mechanism, institutional mechanism. These are my own personal views. I speak <laughs> in my personal capacity. So I personally think that if you gave the choice, you gave a window and you define so that as uh, Sonia was saying, account monitoring, accountability, oversight by the umbrella of the, uh, of the, uh, credit, uh, the creditors, if, if need be, whatever we want to safeguard the interest of the creditors, interest of different stakeholders, define what it should be put to use, but give them a choice to pick and choose the windows that they need to. Because I have to tell you, money is fungible. You allocate money, being a budget fiscal person, uh, you turn around and the money will go somewhere else. <laughs> so it's better you have a defined uh, thing and then you have a monitoring and accountability mechanism. Thank you very much, Shamshad. Um, Paul, there's a related question I'd like to put to you before going to the final one. Um, this is from Stephanie Griffiths-Jones, I'm sure many of you know. Um, Paul, budget support mechanisms are great, but will the creditors be willing to do this without requiring conditionality? If you involve the World Bank, for example, they will certainly expect to put some conditions. So um, what's your initial thought on that? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I mean, um, we explicitly refer in the paper to the experience of the World Bank in terms of their developing development policy lending, what is known as DPLs within the bank. Whereas where the bank um, works out a set of criteria or results by which they provide lending to a, a country. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the environment programming of the bank has been using these environmental development policy lending, where you agree environmental results and then lend money against that. 
So I think uh, by using such a results-based approach where you make payments after countries uh, adhere to certain criteria, you can hopefully reach a compromise between where Sonia's coming from on the creditor side and where Shamshad's coming from on the, uh, on the government side uh, in terms of uh, everyone uh, seeing some accountability and transparency. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, I'm going to move to the final question now because we're running short on time. This is from Alfonso. Um, and it's about the role of local communities. Is there any role for the grassroots to play? Um, can they become policy actors within this process, within programs, um, program approaches that are in theory set up to, for citizen accountability? Um, what is the space for um, bottom-up accountability, if you like, um, and is there any way in which this could be made material and tangible for people in terms of perceiving that there is any direct impact on their lives? Um, I'll go around all three of you on that one. I know it's not an easy question, um, but uh, Sonia, would you like to have the first go at that? So I think I'll address this from the point of view of the investor community. And I, I will say, without aging myself too much, I've been around the block, uh, gosh, must be 30, 35 years now. And I think this, this moment in history is, is, is kind of unique in that regard. If you look back, for example, to the business roundtable here in the US, their statement last year about the need to shift from kind of shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism, that was truly remarkable. And I think we're seeing the repercussions of that kind of thinking throughout the, the investor community. So if there were ever a time when sort of grassroots movements, indigenous peoples, you know, the, the, the needs of the broader stakeholder community are being taken into consideration as part of investment mandates, you know, now, now is that time. Thank you very much indeed, Sonia. Paul, do you want to go next on that, how uh, local communities and bottom-up action fit within program swaps for um, debt swaps for nature and climate? Yeah, great question. Um, and maybe something, to be honest, we could have addressed more in the paper, but we can do that in, uh, in future publications. Um, I mean, basically, what the main way to do it is to make sure that the climate and biodiversity investments are pro poor so that they actually benefit uh, women, children and men who are living in poverty. Uh, so just to give some concrete examples in terms of climate change, looking at making households more resistant to floods, looking at uh, saline crops, uh, looking at post-disaster recovery, after cyclones and floods and, 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 and slow onset climate related disasters. In terms of biodiversity, looking at ways to make sure that forestry investments involve indigenous and local communities, looking at ways that watershed management can involve uh, uh, local people. So all those ways are ways that when you put in place the kind of conditions that I alluded to, the, uh, the criteria and results, you make sure that those are pro-poor and benefit local communities. Thank you very much, Paul. Shamshad, your, any thoughts um, on grassroots yes. involvement? In this I one? think uh, it is essential to have grassroots involvement. Uh, local governments have to be involved um, and people have to be involved. But the reality is that um, the government's external debt is uh, in a number of countries a responsibility of the federal government and servicing and settlement of the liabilities also is that of the, of the federal governments. Now, a lot of federal governments have allowed the flexibility to the state governments uh, to go ahead and borrow, but they need clearances for everything. And there are uh, terms and conditions for that. Now, in this situation, we are talking about uh, using uh, this uh, um, space that is being created uh, from the suspension uh, or for that matter uh, buyback or, uh, or cancellation to then result in local currency resource generation. And in that context, it would be helpful if there was a systematic process to actually engage uh, in the areas 
of biodiversity, nature, and all that, so that the local currency that is generated is deployed, which is much more flexible. There is more flexibility in that rather than the direct foreign exchange uh, settlement issue. So that's one point. The second point is that you really need to develop the capabilities uh, and develop the projects in a fast at a fast pace. And I do think that the uh, uh, the concerned platforms should have uh, project feasibility facilities to allow for quick development of um, uh, projects that could be just ready. Uh, to because as I said, it takes one or two years for all these things to be realized. The last point is with what we are being hit just now, the revenue, um, uh, in our case, uh, rupee, but local currency revenue generation from the tax resources uh, is at its low ebb. And you ultimately also need local currency for these kind of transactions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we'll go now um, for a, a second poll, um, which Juliet will put up. And while we're getting the answers in on that, I will ask each of our speakers for a final contribution. So this poll is who, what actors do you think should take the lead in coordinating a debt for climate and nature swap initiative? Um, you can tag more than one. You don't have to only choose one. So while we're doing that, let me go back to the panel for a final question um, for our speakers. In terms of the next steps and reflecting on what we have, um, you know, heard from the audience and the questions that have come in, what do you think should happen now to implement a debt for climate and nature swap initiative? Um, what should be the next steps in this space, basically? Um, so if you could each try to answer that fairly quickly, a minute each, because we're not far away from the end, that would be brilliant. Uh, Paul, can I ask you to go first? Sure. Um, so, well, I mean, I'm just going to essentially repeat what we've already put in the paper, but, uh, but anyway, for what it's worth, uh, given the fact that we, uh, we have the IMF and World Bank annual meetings coming up, we think it's opportune now to set up a technical working group, possibly led by the World Bank, to take forward an initiative working with the creditors and the debtor governments to set in place a kind of overall init umbrella initiative, a bit like the HIPIC process that was, was used in the, the late 80s for, um, for debt relief um, in low-income countries. Uh, and, uh, and that would uh, work over the next uh, three years or so uh, as, as we've heard, each country is different, so that would provide an umbrella under which individual countries would negotiate with their creditors to take forward this kind of uh, climate for nature program swaps. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Sonia, what would be your, your quick take on what needs to happen now? So I think Paul's, the, the technical working group is, is a fantastic idea and absolutely needed for execution. But what you also need, I think, is a steer from global governance bodies. And here I'd, I'd point to the G20 in particular as, as, as a, a body that has the power to get something like this moving. You know, it is it's a global problem. It, it, it's not going to be resolved at the national level. There are cross-border issues. So a body like the G20 needs to, to address this. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, Shamshad, what would be your, your thoughts on the immediate next steps? I think uh, what uh, Paul and Sonia said is together right. I think what we definitely need out here is um, strong leadership. So when we talk about G20, we should also talk about other international platforms like G24, which has a different uh, mindset uh, on this. So we should definitely look at uh, these global platforms uh, and engage, almost have a, uh, have a summit of the leaders. Now, you know, we have had this FFD financing for development dialogue uh, where a lot of experts, Sonia was there, I was listening to it and contributing. So there have been a lot of people involved in this. Uh, there is there should be a summit on financing for development, which has an element of uh, 
debt swaps out there. So now that an innovative instrument uh, is going to be scaled, we have had this instrument in the past, but we have learned from experience that there are difficult implementation issues that we face. So drawing from those lessons, we should get the political leadership to first agree uh, on this. And I think it's must that we have the World Bank IMF in partnership, but also technical bodies that understand climate issues, biodiversity, um, and some of the UN bodies um, uh, are, are really great into this. And ultimately, it also involves the conventions and the likes of it, because some of this is cross-border. So it's not that simple, but we should keep it simple, but we should involve uh, people who understand cross-border issues also here. Fantastic. Um, really great contributions. Many thanks. So, um, Juliet, can I ask you to put up the results of the second poll? Um, so, yeah, lots of um, people who think everyone should lead, I think, but that's in this context actually okay. Um, so, yeah, and the, um, the general sense is that here that um, probably the bank would be the best coordinator within this, but um, it's by no means a clear result, I would say. There's also 51% um, for environmental NGOs and 49% for OECD governments within that. So huge thanks um, to everyone, to all the participants. Apologies to anyone whose question I wasn't able to get to. Um, but above all, thanks to our excellent panel of speakers, uh, to Paul, to Shamshad and Sonia. They were really great contributions and it was nice to see the way that you built on what each other said and uh, moved us forward through this, which was um, fantastic. Also huge thanks, Paul, to Sijal, your co-author on the paper, um, which is, was great to have. Um, and just a final note, I think as Paul mentioned, uh, the World Bank and IMF annual meetings are happening in October. So we will be looking for ways of feeding this discussion into those meetings. But I'd just finally like to thank everyone, participants and speakers for joining very much indeed. Uh, we will share a link to the paper as well as the recorded session and the presentation slides um, with those that register for the event. And all of that will also be available on our website. And if you do have a minute, please do share your feedback by clicking on the link in the chat box, which will take you to a very simple survey. And with that, I would like to close the webinar and say huge thanks to everyone, particularly Shamshad, Sonia and Paul. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, Thank you. you. I wish you best. Thank you.